Hey guys, welcome back. Skitstone series episode 29. Topic today is going to be very simple GUIs, simple heads up displays, simple elements on the screen. Um, we're going to have talk about buttons and on click functions as well as a brief discussion on the frames per second computation. As an example, I'm going to show you example B from today's episode. And you can see here we have our scene from before, you know, the projection as well from the previous video, the, the depth buffer, the ability to rotate the model, zoom in and out, pan left and right. But also you'll see we have at the bottom these menus. We have a file menu and a view menu. Click on file, you can say I have a quit option. And under view, I have these options here. I can toggle on additional HUD elements. I can show the FPS here. You can see we're getting like 60 FPS. Um, and then if I move the mouse, it's even higher, you can see. And then I can toggle that off. I can toggle back on the mouse position. Like you can see my screen you know, location for my cursor. You can see my resolution there. Um, and you also notice that when I clicked on that button, it changed the word show in show mouse position to hide. Also pretty cool. And then of course I can reset the view back to the defaults and I can, when I'm done, I can just quit the program. So you can do a lot with our very simple implementation. And I wanna show you that entire pipeline, the 3D rendering, the projections, the depth buffer, the mouse cursor handling, all the printing, the calculation of the frame rate, the plotting to memory, the entire data structures for the HUD, all the data for that entire scene, all fits in 23 kilobytes. Static. So, I don't know, that's pretty cool, I think. What do you guys think? Um, so yeah, into the theory here. It's a pretty quick video today. So question number one, very simple, why ha even have a HUD? And there's a couple of reasons, all of them are terrible. Uh, the first one would be maybe to display some valuable information. So here you have Shaggy, for example, you know, he, he's alive, good to know, brown hair, great. Put that in the HUD, sounds good to me. Also, we have these very large monitors nowadays, 16 by nine and the widescreen curve monitors. You can take up screen space, so always good to do that. Um, Next, if you want to impress people, you can always put a bunch of random stuff on the screen, make things look complex. That's always great. And then uh, for us, we'll use it mostly to debug what's going on, to see where the mouse is, to do some maybe ray tracing and see what we're pointing at. That will be helpful in the future. Think about the, the Minecraft F3 menu where you can see where you are, what you're looking at, etc. And then also, let's say you had some kind of mistake in your rendering. Well, why don't you just cover that up with a HUD element? That seems like a good idea to me. So how will we set this up? Well, the idea is pretty simple and it's very extensible and I would say modular and I think it's a pretty neat idea we came up with here. And basically you have three primitive elements that you build the entire HUD with and you can always extend that to more in the future. So us, we have, if you recall, those menu items. So the view menu was actually a group of items. So that's like one element is a group then we have our rectangle elements and those serve both to show information as well as to perhaps be buttons. And then we have text. And so between those three things, you can do everything that you saw just now. But let's say you wanna add icons or images or you wanna add text input or tables or something. Sure, there's plenty of opportunity to extend this system. And the setup is basically that we want a linked list tree structure basically that we can use to kind of capture the setup for the HUD. And so each element will have an opportunity to have both children and cousins. Cousins, well, the idea behind this is basically that you wanna locate things relative to their parents. And so, you know, basically this item here, this group is somewhere on the screen. Right, and then this rectangle is offset from the bigger rectangle, and so is this one, and so is this one, and then the text is offset relative to the rectangle that's its parent, right? And so because of that, you, you can very easily locate things relative to parents. And so children inherit their relative positioning from their parents, but cousins don't. Cousins inherit it from the original parent. So that's kind of how this setup works. So you have a child axis, and a cousin axis. And generally speaking, the grouping, there's no visible component to groups. Um, they're just kind of there just to locate things on the page. Um, rectangles, they have obviously positioning and color and everything like that. And that's why pretty much all of the, I guess you call these leaf nodes or whatever, 
um, they're all kind of, they're either, even this one, I guess, they're, everything that you can see visibly is either going to be a rectangle or text, or if you want to extend this, you can make icons or whatever else. So that's how it works. And here's the setup as far as the structure is concerned. So we have the group element, um, rectangle element, and text element here, and I'll go through all of them and how they kind of work. So for all of these, they have the very first byte is kind of this definition byte, and that describes what this element even is. So if you want to check what the element is, just look at the very first byte, offset zero from the top of the structure. And basically, if it ends with a zero, zero, that's the group element. If it ends in a one, that's a rectangle. And if it ends in a two, that's a text element. And then the first bit is visibility. So we use that to encode whether or not this is visible. And why is that good? Well, because we can toggle that with a simple XOR. An XOR can access bytes in memory, so you can directly toggle this without any kind of move operations. It's very efficient to do so. Um, what else? Oh, one thing I want to point about visibility is that it's not inherited from parent or child. So I can turn off this group visibility, and all the children are still going to be there, shown. Why do we do that? Well, it's a choice. You have to be able to parse the tree anyway, right? To, to render things and to check where the mouse is clicking and stuff, you have to be able to parse the tree. So it doesn't help you to inherit visibility, I don't think. It just makes it more computationally expensive on one end um, versus the other end. So I would rather just, whenever I click, or whenever I want to change visibility, I'll parse the tree and set those values. And whenever I want to draw things, I won't parse the tree. I will just, or we, I'll parse it, but I won't parse it for visibility. I'll parse it only for um, details about location and color and stuff. So it's just a choice I made. You can do whatever you want. Um, so then for the HUD elements, you have the same 21 bytes at the top of every single structure, and that should be maintained even if you add others. If you add icons and text, I would recommend that you, or, or sorry, text inputs, I should say, uh, always keep the same first 21 because this encodes the type of element, then it encodes the pointer to the next cousin and pointer to the next uh, child. So basically that's a pointer in this direction and this direction. And then you have, oh, sorry. You have then after that, the relative location from this element from its parent. So in that case, here you have 0 and 1040. That means we're basically going to be on the x position of our parent, but down quite a bit. So in this case, this is going to be a top level element. So this means, hey, at the bottom of the screen, put our element there, basically. And you can see that this is now the child. So basically, this element will be located relative to this one at offset 0, 0. And then we'll have a width, basically this and this, described by the bottom right corner here. And then of course you have color for rectangles and for text, and you have a font for text and a font size and color of text and stuff. And you have a string for your uh, you know, actual text there. So all that has to be described in these structures. And that's all implemented in this uh, file if you're curious. But more details about this right now, this on-click idea. So how does that work? Well, basically for buttons, they're just rectangles with an on-click parameter. And so, you know, at the end of the structure, there's a quad word, which basically describes a function pointer that you want to execute whenever this rectangle is clicked, this button is clicked. Um, so the idea is if this rectangle is visible, so if this is a one, and if it gets clicked, so if the mouse button is down and the cursor is on top of this particular uh, location on the screen, described by this relative to the parent, and this is not null, this uh, value here, then call that address. And the cool thing about this is that we can pass in an unlimited amount of data based off this button. So. I've set up the idea that whenever you call this address, it passes in on the stack this address. Not this address, but rather the address after this. Meaning, whatever you put here, you can put 10 megabytes of data right here. This will all be x 
accessible by this function. You just have to grab this address off this stack, and then basically start looking <laughs> there for what you, whatever you wanted. Um, so you unlimited space for that data into the onclick function, which I think is pretty cool. And then, yeah, you don't have to use any registers or stack space for this. Just put a pointer to the space and memory and you can access this uh, for yourself. You can even put like configuration information here as well and use that for elements um, down the line. So that's a pretty cool concept. And this is all done in this HUD process mouse and you can see how that works. Last thing I wanna talk about really quickly here is this idea of computing the frames per second. And this is kind of important because I think a lot of the time it's done incorrectly and it's done dishonestly. So we have this function called frame rate poll and you can grab that here if you're curious to take a look. And what it does is you can see here, this basically populates a variable which you can access globally, um, which contains the frame rate over the past 30 frames. So how that works is basically, it's just a timer. It calculates, hey, what's the time? And then wait 30 frames. And then now what's the time and subtract. And the idea is that time that it took, just uh, take the inverse of that for 30 frames and that's your FPS. So a very simple concept, <clears throat> but the there's two caveats to that. First is, if you've noticed, and I could even just quickly run this to show you, um, if I toggle on the FPS, if um, I'm not moving, the FPS isn't changing. So I'm not going to redraw the scene if I don't have to, just to populate the FPS. That's kind of a, a slippery slope, right? If I have to now regenerate the HUD and every element inside the HUD, every time for no reason, like constantly, that's kind of dumb. Um, and also it doesn't really help you to regenerate the FPS if you're not moving, right? It's just, it's just stupid. And that's also caveat number two, which if the screen isn't changing, then there's no frames being drawn, which is actually not infinite FPS, it's actually zero FPS. So, you know, if you see people playing a video game and they're you know looking at something and it's not moving and it says like 10,000 FPS or whatever, like 800 FPS or something, it's just, a lie and not real. So when I move the screen here, you'll see that it drops like to zero, right? See 0 0.6 FPS. Why? Not because it was hard to draw nothing, it's because nothing was drawn, right? Um, so yeah, back to the slides here. We have two examples, they're quick examples. One you already saw, which was the HUD menu. And I'm gonna show you a, a much simpler one that it's not really a menu, just, it just kind of has static info, which you can use more to debug. So I'll show you that right now. So let's close this, quit, go to example A, run this. And you can see here we have our uh, same scene, but in this case, I've only put the elements there statically on the screen. You see the FPS, you see the mouse location, the scene is still there, and then there's a quit button at the top. So this is a much more bare bones version of what you saw before and it doesn't involve all those nested elements and things. It's a little bit simpler. And this is the example I wanted to use just to show how we're computing the FPS and the mouse location. So yep, yeah, with that out of the way, I'm gonna open up the example B and I wanna show you kind of um, how that code is set up. I won't go into too much detail, but I wanna show you some cool things about this. So yeah, this again is the example with just the view menu and the file menu. And by the way, you can have both menus open at once and you can leave them open. Um, and that works just fine. You can do this. There's, there's some issues with this. Maybe go through that first. So the first issue is if I'm clicking, the, the idea of clicking on buttons is a little bit wishy-washy because if I'm clicking on the screen and my cursor happens to go over any of these, you'll see that every time the mouse moves, it toggles this button. I didn't unclick yet, I'm still clicking, and you can see it's constantly re-clicking this particular button. Same thing with this one, I can click these without having to click, just by dragging the mouse and having clicked already. And I can reset the view and then things get wonky because I'm just holding. So there's some glitches with this, right? And things that you could definitely improve. I'm not sure I will ever do that, but I potentially could, and then, uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the big thing there. But into the code now, I wanna show you a couple things. So first, I will show you just a sheer amount of things going on. So normally in these videos, we don't have quite a lot of includes. 
we have very few, if any. Um, here you can see there's so many things and each of these have their own includes. And so that's what's adding up to be that 23 kilobytes that I showed you before. The font, the text, the ability to flush things to memory, that's a new thing I added, um, but it's very simple, so I'm not gonna explain it. Um, this whole idea of a, of a mouse and printing floats and ints to the screen, um, as well as exits is called, there's a lot of things going on. So I'll start with the very bottom where I'm actually defining these HUD elements. And you can see basically down here how that looks. So I have the menu HUD element for the, the top level menu, which is at the bottom, right? And then inside that I have a child and a cousin. So basically what I've done here is I've set up the file submenu as a top level element. So what I just showed you, and I can even pull it up. I didn't have to do this. This is a, a stylistic choice, but um, basically I basically said this is also a top level element, but it's hidden, meaning it's here somewhere. It's this one or this one, etc. And then the file menu is also a top level element, right? It didn't have to be that way. That could have been children of, of this, but I just did this for no reason. So take it for what you will. It's kind of uh, flexible like that. And you can see I'm populating the offsets, X and Y, um, colors, function pointers. Here you can see that file rectangle. If I click it, it's going to toggle the element visibility and well, it will toggle the text of potentially and the, the visibility of everything downstream. Um, you can say I have a view rectangle, I have the file submenu, the quit rectangle, the quit text, the view submenu, the reset rectangle for the view, the toggle FPS, the toggle mouse, then we have the reset text and the FPS text, and we have the mouse position text, and we have the HUD element for the frames per second and the rectangle for the FPS and the text. There's just a lot of stuff in here, a lot of data that's describing the HUD, right? You kind of have to have this. Um, either you put it statically in there or you make it extensible like this and I can update things. I can change the color of different things. Let's say you want to change the mouse text from, I guess, blue to some other color. How about green? You can do that. I can rerun this. And now if I toggle on the was it the mouse? You'll see that the Y value is now green instead of blue. So you can see it's a very flexible type setup. Things can be changed in, in real time. Things can be changed programmatically. I can have a button here that says change font size and all the font sizes can change, you know, etc. right? So a lot of extensibility and modularity is set up in this system. Um, what else? So that's kind of all that. And then as before, I have a bunch of De definitions for like the actual scene. So I have data structures for the perspective and for the geometries on the screen, as well as the cross and the faces and the vertices for that, as well as the cube faces and vertices. I'm not sure we're using this. This is a debugging thing, I'll get rid of that. And then, so you'll notice that there was a bunch of um, function pointers for on click, right? If we clicked on certain buttons, things would turn off. For example, the quit rectangle had a function pointer to this quit function which is defined here in the code and all that does is it clears the screen and exits the program then i had a reset view button right right reset the view back to the original you saw that working right this implements that so this basically copies the perspective and stuff and the view axes from the original to the current then it clears the background, clears the screen, and um, then it does something clever. And this is something that you actually can't do in C, to my awareness. Um, usually, you'll see that we call things, right? We call functions. But a call is just, as far as I'm aware, it's basically pushing the next address onto the stack and then jumping. And so what you see here, I'm Whenever I click reset view, I have to redraw the screen. I can't just reset the perspective. I have to redraw everything that just that we have to draw, right? So that, that includes the everything on the screen, the cube, the cross, the perspective, everything has to be recalculated and the HUD has to be redrawn and everything else, like all the elements have to be redrawn potentially. So I have to call this function frame buffer 3D render depth loop. 
but I don't want to call the whole thing because I don't have to process the mouse and stuff. So I, what I did was I just jumped somewhere in the middle of that program. So he says jump that program or that address dot this. So I'm jumping to the local draw wires label of this function. I'm not calling it. So I'm just hopping somewhere in the middle of a different function, which is why if you notice there's a, an asymmetric amount of pushes and pops in this particular example. That's because I'm kind of spoofing it. I'm pretending I push these things onto the stack. Then I'm calling this function, but I'm not actually calling it. You see, I have a return address value here that I'm manually pushing onto the stack ahead of these bogus pushes. And then I'm basically falling out when this function here returns, it's basically grabbing what I've manually pushed onto the stack as the next address, which is down here. So a little clever thing that I don't think you could do with C. Um, I don't think you can do it in C. I'm, I'm like hundred percent sure you can't do it in C. <laughs> um, so that's one thing I want to show you. But then also here's another thing that you really, you can't do at least easily in C, which you just have a lot more power of these, over these kind of things in assembly. So this this function here is again one of those function pointers that you you know you click on a button and it does something. So here this is the uh, function that changes the word show to the word hide. So if you saw whenever I clicked show FPS, it showed the FPS, but then it changed the word show FPS to hide FPS. So this is the function that does that. And you can see it, it, it hides and shows things like it's supposed to. There's another function pointer for that, but ignore that. Um, but I want to show you about this is the way it's, it's changing the text. So if you recall, there was a string, a null terminated string in memory somewhere that was like show FPS counter or whatever, right? Um, and all we have to do is just change the word show to the word hide if it says show. And if it says hide, change it to show. So, you know, basically toggle that back and forth. And for that, you may have to do like an if statement or something and see and how will that be compiled? It will probably be compiled in a very generic way. But because we know we have a deeper understanding of the problem, we can do things that the compiler will probably never be able to do. So for this, the way this is working is, and by the way, this function only uses three registers, RDI, RSI, RDX. So I can, I can use those inside without having to borrow any other registers from the rest of the software. So what I've done here is I've put one of the strings. So one of these strings that I could replace the text with. So it says show FPS or hide FPS. I want to replace the four characters of hide with show and the four characters of show with hide. So I have those two defined here and I put them in different registers. One's an RSI, one's an RDX. Then I'm checking the actual text, the first byte of the actual text against the ASCII byte S. So if the actual text in memory starts with S, I will conditionally move the hide string on top of the show string. And then I will, either way, I'm going to print whatever's in RSI, four characters of it. So this idea of a conditional move is something that we can do very elegantly and simply here. I really doubt, I don't know if you can check this later, but I really doubt that it would be so elegant and simple and short and terse like this if the compiler were to handle this type of comparison. Okay, and then we have an ability to basically dig down here. This function pointer toggle element and descendant visibility, this just basically digs into the HUD elements um, in the whole tree and basically so if, if I hide this one, this function basically, or sorry, I shouldn't say that. If I toggle the visibility on this, this function here basically toggles the visibility of every single thing below that, but not this one. Only, only children, I believe. Children and then cousins of children. So, but not, not this one would not be toggled if this one was toggled. And how is it toggling visibility? Well, it's doing this toggle with an XOR operation, which is very cool. So you can see here, this is the only thing required. This is it. This is what's toggling visibility. This XOR byte at RDI with this. This is at what, 128 or something? So yeah, that's that's how we're toggling visibility. That's the only thing that we do. And that, that means next time the HUD is processed, 
it just won't draw that because I've now I've now toggled on or off this bit. So pretty cool there. And last thing I want to show about this, um, let me let me two more things. So here's the actual start. This is what the CPU kind of starts at here. So it and it draws the scene. It uh, copies the original axes as you would expect to be able to reset back to those. Um, and then it sets the HUD on. This is something that you have to do as well, just to avoid having to do all this HUD stuff. If you have no HUD, you can basically turn on and off that with a with a bit in memory, the HUD enabled bit. And then there's a loop. And this loop usually it only has one thing, and that is just render the scene, render the scene. Just basically this line here, this line. But now we have to do more than just render the scene. We have to update the frame rate. Right, that has to be calculated every single time the scene is updated. So calculate the frame rate. But then there's a couple things that have to happen as well. I have to get the mouse location and I have to record the frame rate, not like in in like a number format, but actually as text. And up until now, we haven't actually had the ability to write text to memory, only to files. And so I implemented um, basically a couple things here, a function that resets the print buffer and a function that flushes the print buffer to memory. And so basically the idea is, it's very simple, I'm not gonna bother explaining this you know, in, in the video, but this function, print buffer flush memory, just flushes the print buffer as we did in our early videos, but not to a file descriptor, but rather to a memory location in RDI. And so basically we get the, the frame rate with this frame rate calculation thing here, and then we immediately print it as a float onto the buffer and then flush the buffer to a location in memory that we're using to store the FPS. So let's see if I can find that here in memory. It's going to be down here somewhere. You can see the mouse location here. So the string for the mouse position is x colon space and then f uh, four bytes at least of space to put the int, right? Because you have a maximum value of 1920 in x and 1080 in y. So this is enough space to do that. And then a similar story for the FPS. You can see FPS. We have FPS colon space and then I have a bunch of bytes, probably too many bytes to draw the actual floating point number for the, the frame rate string. So that's all being calculated every single frame. We have to recompute those values and then redraw them to memory. So yeah, that's pretty interesting, I thought. And the last thing I wanna show you here, and we talked about this you know, a long time ago, but I wanna just go through this and show you not only the includes and all these bytes at the top, but there's very few instructions that are actually being used to make assembly software, at least the way I do it. We're not using, I mean, it's a CISC, right? Computer with like, you know, a million instructions, but we're only using a very small number. Let's count them, right? Push is one, move and call, that's three. We have an XOR here, that's four. We have a subtract, we're at five now. A jump, we're at six. Pop and return, we're at eight. Um, anything else? Add, now we're at nine instructions total. Okay, we have compare and see move. I don't usually use see move, but we'll count it here. So that's 11. These are all the same, move, push, XOR, pop, return, call, jump, Uh, add and subtract, we counted already. We're at 11 still. 11 instructions total so far. Here's the loop. Here's a condition, sorry, here is a floating point move. If you want to count that as a new one, you can go ahead, fine, 12. Um, but yeah, you see what I'm saying, right? It's all the same instructions over and over and over again used in similar ways. So it's really not that complex. And I'm sure if you were to check all the includes as well, there's only a, a very small number of instructions that I'm actually using in this entire software. So 12, 13, call it 20 instructions to write the entirety of this 23,000 byte binary. That's incredible. You know, basically a thousand of each instruction, a thousand bytes. Well, it's not really how it works. Obviously they're longer than one byte, but you know what I'm saying, right? Like it's a very few number of instructions that we're using to actually do this entire rendering pipeline and 
text plotting and fonts and perspective projection and the HUD and the mouse and all this different stuff. So yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty cool. The ability to do that. Anyway, that was a short video today. We just covered the very basics of HUD elements, very extensible and modular framework we set up for this. You can add, if you wanna add, you can add icons. Maybe we'll do that in a future video. Add text input, maybe you add tables and stuff like that. So yeah, pretty cool opportunities for extension. Pretty cool framework. Uh, I liked doing it, I had fun. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next video.